And we will begin there in verse number 8. Colossians chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 8. Colossians, the second chapter, beginning in there in verse number 8. The Bible says there in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Verse number 9, the Bible says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, as we come to thee in prayer this evening, Lord, I greatly dislike having to discuss such business as what we discussed earlier before we come to thee, Lord God, for preaching of thy word. And yet, Father, we realize that oftentimes in the midst of thy people, Father, and in the midst of thy churches, that there are problems that must be dealt with. And Father, we thank thee, Lord God, so much for our church here. Father, we thank thee for the way that thou hast kept thy hand upon this church now for 220 plus years. Lord God, never has there been a perfect member in this church. Never has there been a perfect pastor to fill this pulpit in the church. And yet, Father, because of thy sustaining grace, because of thy good favor, the church here has stood the test of time, at least for this long. Father, we look unto thee. Lord, we realize that our sufficiency is of Christ. Father, we realize that the perseverance of the saints, Lord God, that it is because of thee, Lord God, and that, that is the only reason that we're able to overcome anything. And Lord God, I pray this evening and I ask of thee, please, Father, take thy word and bless it as it goes forth. Father, I pray that thou would help me, Lord God, to preach thy word with all good zeal as it would please thee. Forgive us for where we have sinned against thee and failed thee. Bind up the working of the enemy in our hearts and in our lives. We love thee and pray and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. We have read verse number 8 there. We have covered it in depth, relatively in depth thus far. But I wanted you to, to once again be reminded, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The believers here, they were in a danger of being persuaded by the things of this world, the tradition of men, so on and so forth, even after the things that they needed to sustain life. And they, they were instructed there, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. But then it goes on in verse number 9, the start of our text for this evening, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power beloved you see when it comes to our thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number eight there had spoken there about innocence being spoiled for the cause of Christ or spoiled for Christ but the Bible then goes on to declare for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily you see there were some people that they would take and say yes we will grant it to you as a, as a local New Testament church. We understand that you're promoting this one called Jesus. And if need be, we will go along with you on that. We will take and say, Jesus was a good man. We will take and say that he was probably a carpenter. We will even go so far as to say he was a miracle worker, if you will. We will go so far as to take and say that he had a large following while he was here upon this earth. But many of those people were unwilling to go ahead and admit that Christ was God manifested in the flesh. You see, beloved, as the scripture tells us, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible goes on to say, and ye are complete in him. You see, beloved, if Christ is not truly God manifest in the flesh, 
the fact that we're in Christ, it profits us absolutely nothing. You see, in other words, if someone were to take and tell me that the building is on fire and someone is going to come and pick you up and carry you out of the building. You see, if it would be Mary Kate that someone said, don't worry a thing about it, Brother Spears. Mary Kate, she's running to the front of her building, of the building. She's going to throw you over her shoulder and she's going to carry you out of this building. You know what? I'm sorry. I love Mary Kate, but that doesn't instill much confidence in me because Mary Kate is still but a tiny little child. She's weak, if you will. She couldn't even begin to think about probably carrying one of my shoes, much less my whole body. You see, beloved, one people tell us, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead body, unless we recognize Jesus Christ to truly be God manifest in the flesh. For someone to take and say, and ye are complete in him. If Christ is not God, then the fact that we are in him, it means absolutely nothing. If Christ is not God, then we are of all men most miserable because we have believed in someone who is not truly able to save us. Look back, a familiar passage to John chapter number 1, the Gospel of John chapter number 1. In verse number 1, the Bible says in defining or in uh, describing the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is indeed God manifest in the flesh. The Bible says the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, beloved, as we stop to think about this, as the Bible tells us about Christ and the fact that all things were made by Him. So oftentimes in our minds we think, well, yeah, the sun, the moon, the stars, those things were all made by Christ, and we, will, we may acknowledge that. But I'd like for you to carry it even further in your hearts and in your minds this evening for those of you who are here this evening who are Christians and realize, do we not even realize that the trials, the various things that we face in our life, all of those things were divinely put in place by the Lord? Yeah. What I mean by that, beloved, is that when it comes to the trials and the testing that we face in life, there are times that people may take and say, well, I'll tell you what, the devil has really jumped up. He's in control now, and we're going through hard times because of the testings of the devil. Do we not fully admit, beloved, we say God is sovereign, God is all-powerful over everything, but we must also realize and admit there that everything that we face in this life, beloved, that they have been divinely appointed by the Lord. I'm not saying that God is the author of sin, but what I am saying, even the things that come into our life, the sins that we commit, beloved, even as with David and Bathsheba, with Solomon, with all of the Old Testament saints, with all who have gone on before us, even the sins of men can in a roundabout way end up bringing glory to the Lord. Now, beloved, I'm not saying that God is the author of sin. I'm not saying that we should go out and sin that grace may abound. But what I'm saying is that every last thing that we face in life, beloved, the whole situation that we're facing here with Georgetown right now, I'm not saying that God is the one that has caused all of those things. But what I am saying is this. Before the foundation of the world, the Lord knew exactly what was going to be happening with the church there at Georgetown. Before the Lord allowed Brother Van Noonan to become pastor, I'm not saying the Lord made a mistake. The Lord's sovereign. He can put up one man and take down another man at his good pleasure, you see. But in all of those things, beloved, when the Lord called Brother Van Noonan to be pastor there at Grace in Georgetown, the Lord still knew all about these things that we would face. Beloved, the Bible once again says, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, Colossians 2, verse 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ is absolutely 100% God manifest in the flesh. He's not merely a manifestation of a portion of the Lord, but He is indeed God manifest in the flesh. Now notice there in verse number 10 where the Bible says, And ye are complete in Him. And ye are complete in Him. One thing that strikes me in such an amazing way so oftentimes is that as we watch this world, 
And we watch people, some people, maybe when they're at an early age, they will feel like, you know what, stardom. Or maybe for a young lady, she will think if I'm glamorous, then I will finally re, uh, reach a level of satisfaction in life. I'll finally kind of find my niche in life if people will recognize how glamorous I am. For someone else, maybe at an early age, they feel like, you know what, if I have plenty of money in the bank, if I'm successful in life, then finally this void here in my heart, it will be filled and everything will be just wonderful after that. For someone else, it may be prestige, if you will. But the Bible clearly states, and ye are complete in Him. Beloved, for all who are yet outside of Christ, you're incomplete. You're incomplete, period. And you can look to all of the ways of this life and the things of this world to finally figure out how to fill that void that is in your heart, that's in your life. You can look to all of the things of the world. And some people will turn to uh, Yogi the Bear, amen? No, some people will turn to yoga. Some people will turn to transcendental meditation. Some people will turn to drugs. Some people will turn to alcohol. All of these different areas. What is it that they're trying to achieve? Why is it that Rockefeller, one ask how much money will ever be enough? Just one more dollar. Why is it millions of dollars could not finally bring that man to the point where he said, Whoo, I'm done, I'm satisfied, I finally feel fulfilled, I feel complete in life. It is because he was yet outside of Christ. He had never yet come to know the completion which can be found in Christ. The Bible says, and ye are complete in him. Which, the, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hand in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, beloved, the picture there is, of course, obviously pointing back to the Old Testament practice of circumcision, but it was a matter of being cut off, if you will, well, the Bible says there, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hand. In other words, for all who are truly people of God this evening, and I want to say this carefully, we have been cut off from being a slave to our sins any longer. Now, am I here this evening saying that we're sinless? No, I'm not saying that at all. Am I here this evening saying that we will never see land? No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is because of what Christ has done upon the cross of Calvary, Whenever we choose to commit sin and we go out and we sin, it is because we want to and not because we have to. You see, before we were saved, we would go out and we would drink iniquity like water. We would go out and sin and sin and sin. And why is it that we would do that? It is because sin was our master. We had to. We were obliged to. We were a slave to sin. Am I saying that that gives us a little bit of innocence along the way? No, I'm not saying that at all. Because we were all too happy to obey the sinful nature in our lives. But after we have been saved, we now have a new nature dwelling within us. We can no longer take and say, well, I didn't want to sin, but I just had to. No, that's not the case at all, because we've been cut off in that respect. Sin is no longer our master, if you will. The Bible says in verse number 12, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. For all who have been baptized... When you were up here in the baptistry, no matter who it was that baptized you, when you were lowered down there and you were immersed into that water, that was a picture of you taking part in the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a picture of what Christ has done in your life. Now, thankfully, I don't believe anyone's been left down there. Amen? Not only were you buried with Christ, you see, beloved, but when you were raised back up out of that water, that is a picture of the fact that you are bearing witness to the resurrection of Christ. You now have new life within you because of what Christ has done, and that is a picture of what was done there. The Bible says there in verse number 13, and you being dead in your sins. Now how were we before Christ had done anything for us? The Bible says, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Can any of you men give me Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 1 from your memory? And you? Go ahead. I'm sorry, brother. 
And you are the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And you had the quickened who were dead. You weren't just merely sick in trespasses and sins. You weren't a little bit under the weather in trespasses and sins. But beloved, the Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We did not have the ability to save ourselves. We didn't have the ability to bring ourselves up from the grave any more than a corpse in a coffin has the ability to bring themselves up from the grave. The Bible says in you being dead in your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh, we were bound to the flesh at that time, have he quickened. He's given life to us, you see. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many of you have ever been in debt, serious debt? Boy, some of you are blessed, amen. The ones with your hands down, you're blessed. How did it feel when that debt was paid? I, I don't know about you folks, but there have been some bills that I've had, and man, I'll tell them, oh, man, we've got to turn all of our guns on this bill or whatever it may be. I want to get that crazy thing paid off no, no matter what it takes. And maybe we will take and we will say, we're not going to eat out for a month. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do that. Because we're going to take and declare war on this particular bill. And that thing for me, maybe it will weigh on my mind. Well, you know what? When that bill is finally completely paid, you know what? I feel so liberated. But to be able to sit back and say, man, it is paid in full. I'm no longer under bondage to them anymore. I'm now free of that debt. Well, beloved, how much more when the Lord saved us? When the Bible says in you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Whew. Forgiven. 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 You know what? Sometimes when someone will take and say, I forgive you for something, they may really forgive you and they may not. Sometimes they will joke about our wives being experts in ancient history. That was a joke Brother Lawson told me. And just in case your wife was not mad at you, Brother, I thought I'd bring it up again to encourage you. Amen? Sometimes men will joke about their wife. My wife's an expert in ancient history. What do you mean by that? Well, she always remembers all the bad things I've done. Sister Lawson, I disagree with that. Amen? But the point this evening being, beloved, that there are times that we may take, and every last one of us, we may take and say, why well, forgive that person of this? Maybe a week down the road, maybe a month down the road, something will come up and we will wind up developing a little bit of ought, a little bit of bitterness in our hearts. And if they would ask us, have you forgiven me? Yeah, yeah, I've forgiven about it. I've forgiven you about it. Have you forgotten it? No. Beloved, let me tell you something at this juncture here this evening. We will not keep you long. Sometimes people feel like that forgetting and forgetting go hand in hand. Now think about this with me. Sometimes people feel like that forgiving and forgetting go hand in hand. Now here's the point this evening. There will be times that maybe, maybe I will take and look at someone and I will take and say, I have forgiven you. Or maybe, maybe you're in this position that I... You will look at someone and say, you know what, I have forgiven you. But then you will take it in your heart and in your mind, you will have this struggle. Because you'll feel like, Lord, if I have forgiven that person of this, why is it that in my heart and my emotions I keep going back and I wind up bitter over it all again? If I have truly forgiven them, then I should also forget it and I'd move on from it. You know why, beloved? I'm sorry. But our minds... Until the effects of sin came upon us, our minds were not designed to forget things. Now, I know maybe you think, Brother Spears, you're a hypocrite in saying that. Look how bad your memory is. But in other words, beloved, our, our minds were designed to remember things. I'm thankful when I come here to the church, I don't have to get my cell phone out and say, take me to 3175 Briar Hill Road. I remember the way, you see. I'm thankful that when I get up in the morning, I remember where the kitchen is, where the bathroom is. I remember sometimes where I put my shoes last night. You see, our minds were designed to take and withhold things, if you will. Our minds were designed to retain information, if you will. And there will be times that the devil himself will take and bring that up to us, that someone will take and say, well, if I have truly forgiven them, then why can't I forget it? There's a difference between those two things. 
And there are times that we have to just flat out tell ourselves, you know what, I've forgiven them and I'm walking away from them. I'm willfully not going to think about it. But you know what the problem is that there are times in our mind that we begin to think about something and we are faced in a moment of time, am I going to think about this? Am I going to meditate on it? Or am I going to take my mind and go somewhere else? Will I meditate on a Bible verse instead of meditating on my bitterness? Or will I hold this bitterness? In a moment of time, oftentimes, we are faced with that exact scenario. Am I going to hold this in and get bitter about it? Or am I going to let go of it? Let me tell you something, bitterness can eat you up. You know what? When the Lord forgives us because He is God, He is able to take and put all of our sins behind Him and He's able to take and say, I will remember them no more. In other words, because He is God, He's able to take and do that. Say, I'm not going to remember them anymore. But beloved, we're not God. And there are times that those thoughts may come up on us again. And in that moment of time, we're faced with that decision. Will I harbor this? Will I meditate on it? Or will I walk away from it? Beloved, when it comes to bitterness, we need to realize that even as the Bible says that the Lord has forgiven you all trespasses. I hate to say it, but there was a period in time that of my life that I used to take the Lord's name in vain. And I still don't like what goes around for a lot of times of using the Lord's name in our day and age, to be honest with you. But that's not the sermon for this evening. You know what? If you were to take my son's name in vain, and then my son were to die in a car wreck, I would probably, whenever I see you, I'd think, you know what? I, I still remember what you said about my son. It'd be hard for me to let go of. And yet, beloved, for those who have taken the Lord's name in vain, for how long did we take the name of the only begotten Son of God in vain? You know what? He's forgiven us of those things. Beloved, furthermore, think with me about this. Who nailed Christ to the cross? We know who the instruments were that the Lord used, but whose fault was it that Christ went to the cross? Whose was it, Brother Baker? It was Brother Baker's. It was mine, it was Myra Spears's, it was Sister Stennis, Brother Stennis, Sister, for everyone who is here this evening saved, you know what? It's your fault that Christ went to the cross. It's your fault that he suffered. It is your fault that he went through all of the agony that he went through. It's your fault that he died. Beloved, how would we feel if it was my child? What would happen if one of my sons would go on a hunting trip and somebody would accidentally shoot him? If that happened with Seth Anderson, brother, it would take a lot of grace for me to continue on here with you if, if you accidentally shot my son. By the Lord's grace, I could. But think about this, beloved. It was because of our sins that Christ was nailed there to the cross of Calvary. And yet, what is God the Father's attitude towards us? He's forgiven us of all of our trespasses. Every one of them. Imagine if a man was facing life in prison or possibly even the death penalty. And he would receive a pardon for that. He was guilty, as guilty could be. There were eyewitnesses. It was on film and everything else. I mean, he's guilty. I mean, he's, he's, going, he's going to get lethal injection. But he receives a pardon. You know what? If he also had a parking ticket in his glove box after he receives that pardon, that parking ticket's going to seem rather a light thing after having escaped death, is it not? But I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Beloved, we have been forgiven of all of the sins that we have committed against the Lord, every last one of them. While I don't make light of trials such as what we're going through with Georgetown or trials that we've gone through in the past, you know what? We've been forgiven of our sins. 
we've been forgiven. There's nothing that I have to do in order to take and cause the Lord to forgive me simply because of his good pleasure there upon the cross of Calvary. All of my sin debt was paid for. Beloved, when we face the trials of life, this should be an encouragement to us. And you, being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The same kind of love which has been shown to us through God the Father, we ought to love one another in the same manner, exactly the same manner, now think with me this evening about this, beloved. When it comes to us and our relationship with God and the trials that we go through here upon this earth, if we would think more often upon the fact that we are complete in Christ, we are complete in Him. Now there's one last small point that I want to cover while we're here. Even as it is when the Bible says, and ye are complete in Him. This is, in, of course, the text there, the the context is dealing with the salvational sense and the fact that when the Lord saved us, we are complete in Him. So that is dealing with salvation, and ye are complete in Him. It goes on to talk about the being cut off through the circumcision not made with hands. It goes on to talk about the picture of baptism, that we have been buried with Him, that we have been raised with Him. But I want you to think furthermore about this, beloved, that when it comes to us abiding in Christ, as the Bible tells us to abide in me, abide in me, we are to abide in Christ. Now here's the point this evening. There are times that even when we as Christians come to the place in our lives that we fail to abide in Christ, that we can find ourselves in an incomplete. I'm not saying that we're lost again. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that even as we're found in Christ when it comes to salvation, when it comes to us abiding in Christ, in other words, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. When it comes to us and we're faced with a decision, will I think like Christ? Will I act like Christ? Will I react like Christ? And we're faced with that decision. Will I be like Christ? Will I not be like Christ? You know what? If I choose to be like Brent Spears one day instead of being like Christ, you know what's going to happen in my life? The wheels are going to come off of it and things are going to begin to get miserable because the mind of Christ is not in me as the Bible says it should be. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now think with me about this this evening. If we come to the place in our lives that we fail to abide in Christ, now once again, I want to be clear, I'm not saying it makes us lost again. But what I am saying is that it causes us to neglect the leading of the Spirit of God and instead of leaning not to our own understanding or instead of leaning to, un to trusting in the Lord with all of our heart, we begin to lean to our own understanding. And when we begin to lean to our own understanding, we say, say Lord, help me through this problem. Help me to think right. Help me to act right. Help me to do right. We can either have that attitude or we can take say, you know what, I'm too busy to consult the Lord in this and I'm just going to lean to my own understanding and I'll do that which is right in my eyes. Don't look at me like I'm from outer space. I know that we have all done that. We have come to the place in our life where we take and say, I know what the Lord would have me to do and I know what Brent Spears would like to do. And now which one will I follow? Which one will I follow? When we begin to act like we are independent agents, that we can operate independently apart from the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God, then we're going to find ourselves in trouble. We will say things that we shouldn't say. We will think things that we should not think. Maybe go places that we should not go. Beloved, and ye are complete in Him. Out of Him, in the salvational sense, we're lost. And if we fail to abide in Him, then we will find ourselves in a great dilemma. Because on one hand, we will have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within us, who we are trying to quench in a sense, and then we will have our own self-will leading us at the same time. The question this evening then, the Bible says that you are the servants to whoever you obey. Who will we obey? Will we obey Christ, acknowledge that we must be in Him, or will we lean to the arm of our flesh and trust in ourselves instead? Let's all stand. Brother Ardor, if you'll come lead us.